Thus the Lord God showed me, and behold, a basket of summer fruit. And he said, what do you see, miss? And I said, it's a basket of summer fruit. And the Lord said to me, the end has come for my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. The songs of the palace will turn to wailing in that day, declares the Lord God. Many of the corpses, in every place they will cast them forth in silence. Hear this, you who trample the needy, do away with the humble of the land, saying, I know the new moon be over so we may sell grain. And the Sabbath, that we may open the wheat market to make the bushel smaller and the shekel bigger, and to cheat with dishonest scales. So as to buy the helpless for money, and the need for a pair of sandals, that we may sell the refuse of the wheat. Verse 7. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, indeed, I will never forget any of their deeds. Because of this, will not the land quake and everyone who dwells in it mourn? Indeed, all of it will rise up like the Nile, it will be tossed about and subside like the Nile of Egypt. <clears throat> it will come about in that day, declares the Lord God. And I shall make the sun go down at noon and make the earth dark in broad daylight. Then I shall turn your festivals into mourning and all your songs into levitation. I will bring sackcloth on everyone's loins and baldness on every head. And I will make it like mourning for an only son. And the end of it will be like a bitter day. Behold, days are coming, verse 11, declares the Lord God. When I will send a famine on the land, not a famine for bread, or a thirst for water, but rather for hearing the words of the Lord. And people will stagger from sea to sea, and even from the north, and from the north even to the east, and they will go to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. And that day the fruitful virgins and the young men will faint from thirst. Those who swear by the guilt of Samaria who say, As your God lives, O Dan, and as the way of Ersheba lives, they will fall and not rise again. An article back in 2011, last year, it started like this. After he lost much of his hearing last year at age 57, the composer Richard Einhorn despaired of ever really enjoying a concert or musical again. Then he went to the Kennedy Center in Washington where his voice of light ratio had once been performed with the National Symphony Orchestra for a performance of a musical. There were no special headphones. This time, the words and music were transmitted to a wireless receiver in Mr. Einhorn's hearing aid using a technology that has just started to make its way into public places in America, a hearing loop. <coughs> the article is entitled, The Hearing Aid That Cuts Out All the Clatter. If you're hard of hearing, you might want to hear this. Hey. A hearing loop, continues the article later on, Typically installed on the floor around the periphery of a room is a thin strand of copper wire radiating electromagnetic signals that can be picked up by a tiny receiver already built into most hearing aids and cochlear implants. When the receiver is turned on, the hearing aid receives only the sounds coming directly from a microphone. It's quite interesting. As a matter of fact, you can actually go online and uh, find that article yourself. And they actually, uh, on the article, they'll, they'll put in contrast what a person hears uh, when they're in a subway station, and then they, just regular with the hearing aid and everything, and then it, 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 you get to hear what a person hears when they have one of these hearing loops. Crystal clear, you can't, even, you can't hear the subway going by. The person only hears what the person is saying in the microphone. It's, it's amazing. Seems to be a good idea. Especially given the fact that hearing aids, they aren't cheap these days. The most expensive that I found on the internet was 5,000 pounds. Pounds, you know, English pounds, which is equivalent to $8,100 for one. For one, $8,100 for one. A couple weeks ago, I heard somebody got a hearing aid that cost $5,000 here in Congo. That's a little bit of money, don't you think? For a hearing aid. And yet, some people hear, but they don't really hear, right? 
Have you ever had this happen to you? Someone's talking to you, and you just kind of, you kind of check out? I did that at the dinner table the other night, or dinner table or something like that. <laughs> I said, Chloe, I'm sorry, I'm back. What were you saying? Here I am. And she goes, that was weird. <laughs> just kind of, you know, somebody's looking at you, right? You just kind of check out. And then you're talking, and you can tell they kind of check. Or somebody's not even telling. The person goes, okay, I'm back. I wasn't listening. What was that? So they're hearing you, but they're not really hearing you. They get that blank stare. Jordan, are you there? Oh, yeah. Now we laugh. But do we do this with God's word? Do we hear his word, but we're not really hearing his word? Is it just another thing to hear? What you really need to hear? We've been looking at in the book of Amos, coming towards the end. And the question is, does God care? Yes, he cares. He cares very much so. He cares and he will judge justly. He'll always have warnings. He'll always have hope. He'll always have mercy. He has that. And, and here, we're going to see in Amos chapter 8 is an important aspect about God's word. God cares that we hear his word. We hear his word. God told Israel, through the prophet Amos, that Israel would face his just judgment. Because they did not care to really hear his word. and want to hear his word. And his judgment was not going to be pretty. So God cares. God cares that we hear his word. He wants us to hear his word and to really hear his word. You come back to the two main themes. The name is social injustice and ineffective religious formalism. Religious hypocrisy. See, it doesn't matter... It's not going to matter if you're here today, this morning. What matters is if you hear. And God wasn't concerned so much about them doing all their religious rituals. Oh, you have to do this, you have to do this. You have to come to the church service. You have to be here at 9 30, and then you do, and you come at 11, and 11, and you leave at 12 30. That's not the issue. If you think that's what it's about, you've missed it. Because they missed it. They thought it was just about the ritual. It doesn't matter so much that you're here this morning. What matters is that you hear. You hear God's word. You hear the truth. You hear what God is saying. That's what matters. And first off, here in verses 1 and 2, we see that Israel was right for judgment. They were right. They were right for judgment. The Lord showed Amos a basket of summer food, and he asked him, what do you see? He said, a basket of summer food. The Lord said to me, the end has come for my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. It's hard to see the connection in this, these two verses, because you said, well, so you see summer food, and he says, the end. You know, you just kind of go, what? What's, I, what? I don't understand. Well, because see, in Hebrew, the word for summer fruit and the word for the end is actually the same thing. In Hebrew, you understand, which goes from right to left, it's mostly, not mostly, at all, it's just consonants. You know, C, D, T, P. And the vowels are oral. You know, we have A, I, O, U, and when you write it, you have, you know, cat, C, A, T. When the Hebrew, you just write CT, and then you automatically know orally that an A is inserted. So when you read Hebrew, the Masoretes centuries ago, they were able to determine this is how you're supposed to say these words, and then they have little dots. So you have all this scribble of Hebrew, and then you have these little dots everywhere. And when I was in seminary, we had to memorize, because those are the vowel points, how you say these vowels, how you put these dots together. This dot says A, this dot says A, this dot says E, this dot says U. You had to memorize all that stuff, which was crazy. But that's, that's Hebrew. 
Even today, Yiddish, it's the same way. It's, it's all oral. You don't see vowels. It's just consonants. <coughs> so in the Hebrew, you have the same consonants for summer fruit and end. Now, the words have different roots, but see, in the north, they were pronounced identically. So you, when you said summer fruit, you were saying the end in the northern kingdom. So now you can kind of get why the Lord is saying this. They are summer fruits. The ripe fruit, and you would think ripe fruit is good to eat, right? It's delightful, right? And you, when, you, when you take an orange and you peel it back and, and you take one of those slices and you bite into it, and it, and it's, it just starts going all over you, right? Oh, aren't those just the best oranges, right? Or you take an apple and you bite into it and it's, it's just running down, right? And you're just, oh, it's so good. So, so tasty. So something that's tasty, it's ripe. In reality, it meant the end. It was not delightful. It was not good. It's the end for them. Because they lacked fruit. The fruit of compassion. The fruit of mercy. The fruit of justice. Of holy sincerity. Of genuineness. Of humility before God. They missed it. The summer fruit ripens, ready to be harvested. So God's judgment was ripe to come upon Israel. They, they were ripe for God's judgment right then. And did you see that part there, the end of verse, of verse two? I will spare them no longer. That's the same phrase as, as written in chapter seven, verse eight. Remember he said that earlier in chapter seven, verse eight, I will spare them no longer, which literally means I will not pass by them anymore. Which takes us back. Do you remember this? It takes us back to Exodus 34. When the Lord passed by Moses. And it was, it was an act of mercy. It was an act of grace. I, I, the Lord, the Lord, the compassion and grace is God. Slow to anger. Because Moses said, show me your glory. Because Israel overlooked the Lord. They did not hear his word. You are no longer passed by them with mercy. So they were right for God's judgment right then. And yet, it's interesting because what did Amos observe? So, so Amos, he prophesies the end, right? He says, you guys are going to come to the end. But then Jeroboam, he continued to prosper on his throne for possibly up to 10 more years. At least three more years. The army of Assyria came into 722 BC, but the destruction was spread out over three decades. So wait a second. So Amos is saying you guys are coming to the end, but yet the end doesn't come until 10 years later. Think about 10 years. What were you doing 10 years ago? If you were 60, now. If you were 50 then. If you were 20 now, you were 10 years old, right? If you're 10 now, you weren't even in existence 10 years ago, right? Levi? Right? Ten years, that's a, you know, I mean, it's not a long time, but it is a long time. So here he, he's saying the end's coming, but it's going to be ten years. So what do we make of this? Well, when we see something that deserves God's judgment, we don't see things happen right away. We have to trust God knows what he's doing. Even though we don't understand his time. Well, God's time, not our time, right? See, if God, it seems that God is being slow in bringing his justice, it's because he's showing his grace. He's giving time, more time for others to repent and turn in. That's why. The sad part is that people won't, people won't turn to Christ. People won't re respond because God needs to do work in their heart, right? In the spirit of God needs to do work in our heart. So when you see something and you're just like, Lord, well, why do you keep letting this happen? Why don't you bring justice? Why, why do you keep letting this thing or that thing take place? Be patient. God's allowing more time because he wants to show more of his grace. And really, when you think about it, God is showing his grace to Israel at this time because he allowed them to continue for 10 more years. That's his grace, right? 
So Israel, they're ripe for judgment. They're ripe for judgment. Now we have to ask two questions. Two questions that come to mind. The first question is this. Why would he judge them? First question is, why would he judge them? And the answer is pretty clear. Because they did not truly hear his word. Because they did not truly hear his word. You see that verses 4 through 7. He says, hear this, you who trample the needy to do away with the humble of the land. Bring the new moon be over so we get some grain, the Sabbath, to open the wheat market. To make the bushel smaller, the shuckle bigger, to cheat with dishonest scales, to buy the helpless for money. The need for a pair of sandals. To be sell the refuse of the wheat. The Lord is sworn by the pride of Jacob. I will never forget their deeds. They trampled the needy. They did away with the humble. He's mentioned this before, chapter 2, verse 4. They violated the Mosaic Covenant. They exploited the poor. Here's people dying of starvation. They have to sell themselves into slavery. There's a lack of nourishment, lack of clothing, lack of shelter, but no one cared. They didn't care. They were faithless. Faithless to the covenant, they supported their brutality. They endorsed the, the, the exploitation of their own people. The wealthy and powerful disdained the needy, and they disdained God's word. They didn't care. And see, they had such religious hypocrisy. Oh, they were so good at those rituals. Oh, they were so good making sure they're there, making sure they're part of We want to get our sacrifices. Yeah. But they weren't listening to the law and how they're supposed to treat each other. And notice in verse 5 how they complain. Oh, man. When's the new moon going to be over the Sabbath so we can get more moolah? It's going to be over. I mean, they were eager to, 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 to be greedy and, and to cheat their brethren. They could hardly stand it. Oh, those poor merchants. Isn't it terrible? I felt bad for them when I read this, didn't you? They had to wait. How would they cheat their customers once business would resume? Notice he said the bushel. Make the bushel smaller, the shekel bigger, to cheat with this on the scales. The bushel, they have smaller containers. Do you notice that already at the stores today? Remember you used to buy this much? Now you're buying this much, the same price, but now it's smaller. But there's no inflation. Yeah, right. <laughs> Don't listen to that. The shekel, they overweigh it. The buyer thought he was receiving more than when he, when he weighed his grain. They were cheating him by rigging the scales. All of these were forbidden in the law of Moses. All of these. They didn't care. They, they did not hear God's word at all. They were committed more to their little religious rituals and, and then profiting from that than obeying God's word. They want to make money. Sell less for more money. That was more important to them than truly worshiping the Lord. Some questions to ask ourselves. How much of our thinking during times of worship are we self-serving and not God-honoring? For our attendance at corporate worship, do we have a desire to worship God, worship with God's people, or is it more out of an obligation? Oh, I have to be here. Are we thinking more about what to do after the service? Gosh, this guy going to be over. I'm going to put lunch. Get okay, lunch together and then go out. Is that what we're thinking about? See, that's why I said earlier, the, the, the issue is not that you're here. Not necessarily about you being here, but it's about you hearing. You hear. Hear God's word. Don't be like Israel. Don't think that it's just what you check it off your little list. Thinking, okay, I gotta come to church, I gotta do this. That's how we think. We think that way. I think that way. And then in verse 6, you buy the helpless for money, the needy for a pair of sandals. Here they're buying the poor to be their slaves. You're not supposed to be doing that. And then we sell the refuse of the wheat. So they would mix the chaff in with the wheat, with the grain. So they're receiving less grain, but they're paying more for it. 
Oh, that's really nice. They sell worthless goods. Less grain, more junk. And the people had to pay their prices. The merchants would conjure up. There was no such thing as price matching. You do that Walmart, right? Price, price matching. There was no such thing as price matching. Mm -mm. You had to pay these falsely way overpriced food prices. The people were totally dependent upon these thieves. The false weights, false measures, false scales. So they can depend upon them. They sold a worthless part of the wheat. Because all they wanted was money. Another question. Has materialism taken us to the point that we are self-serving in our motives? Is it more important that we personally profit instead of profiting someone else? Are we greedy? Are we greedy with our resources? Here's a better question. Are we greedy with our time? It's almost like we're ready to give our resources, but when it comes to my time, don't bother me, right? And then verse 7, the Lord is sworn by the pride of Jacob. I will never forget any of their deeds. Indeed, I will not forget. This is striking. You, you see that? The Lord is sworn by the pride of Jacob. What's that mean? Well, God usually swears by nothing higher than himself. Now, now some scholars see this as a him being sarcastic with Israel's pride. But I don't think so. I, I think there's another word for the Lord himself. In other words, he's saying this. The Lord swore by himself. He is the true pride of Jacob. When they were taking pride in everything else, he says, no, no, you guys should take pride in me. That's what he's saying. Me. And the Lord God. I am your true pride. I'm the one you should boast in. I'm the one you should focus on. And I'm the one who sees what you're doing, and I won't forget. Though they have consistent religious rituals, and they're so good at that. Oh, they're so good at coming to church. Oh, they're so good at doing, taking care of that stuff. And yet, in reality, they have selfish practices relationally. God will never forget what they've done. They, they ignored God and his word. They ignored God and his word. I put some cross-references up there for you, Jeremiah. As I told you, was it last week or the week before that? I was reading through the Old Testament. I made it through Jeremiah, Alma, and Ezekiel. I thought I'd put some of these up there for you because these passages are striking. I, I know they're connected to Judah, but the, the south, but the north was doing the same thing. Jeremiah 25, 4 and 5 the Lord has sent to you all his servants, the prophets, again and again. But you've not listened nor inclined your ear to hear, saying, Turn now everyone from his evil way and from the evil of your deeds, and dwell in the land which the Lord has given to you and your forefathers forever and ever. They didn't listen. 29, 19. Because they not listened to my words, declares the Lord, which I've sent to them again and again by my servants, the prophets. But you did not listen, declares the Lord. Also, I've sent to you all my servants, the prophets, sending them again and again, saying, Turn now every man from his evil way. Amend your deeds. Do not go after other gods to worship them. You might not listen. And then 44, 4. Yet I sent to you all my servants, the prophets, again and again, saying, Oh, do not do this abominable thing which I hate. But they did not listen or incline their ears to turn from their wickedness, so as to not burn sacrifice to other gods. They will not listen to God's word. Not only was that true for Judah, it was definitely true for the northern kingdom. They did not hear his word. That's why, that's why he would judge them, because they did not truly hear his word. They ignored God and his word. So how would he judge them? This is where things get gruesome. First by death. First way you can do it by death. In verse 3. 
The songs of the past will turn to wailing in the name of the present Lord. And many of the corpses in every place they will cast them forth in silence. This is not a happy verse. The palace, or, or, or you could even translate the temple songs, will turn to wailing from rejoicing the great sorrow. This is sad because there will be numerous dead bodies. And the bodies will be everywhere. They'll be piled up so much so the people will be silent. The song. No words. You, you see that word cast? The idea is the bodies will be thrown with no burial. And the idea is that they, they suffer a violent death. You know what I immediately thought of? this verse, I immediately thought of World War II concentration camps. Immediate thought came to mind. You ever seen those pictures? Of just bodies everywhere? I mean, I, I didn't even want to put those up on the screen. But look, look at these words in, in the text. Corpses. Everywhere. Cast or thrown. Silence. You, you feel the, the emotion of those words. Beautiful songs of joy. They're, they're turned into sudden bursts of wailing. There's screams, there's loud crying. And no one says anything. There's no way to give consolation. The other thing I was reminded of as I studied this was what Jesus said in Matthew 13, 41 and 42. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. In that place there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you give people the gospel, when you evangelism, you must have the courage to tell the unsaved that they will face God's impending judgment if they do not repent and trust in Jesus. And if you're here this morning and you're not a follower of Jesus, you must hear what I'm saying. You will face death. You will face judgment. This is for you. If you don't turn away from your sin and put your trust, throw yourself Fling yourself upon Jesus. We cannot give people messages to make them feel good. To make them feel good about themselves. Or it will result in disaster. You must exalt Christ and the result of yourself, their salvation. God is, is a holy God. He must judge sin. Because you're rebellious. We are rebellious people. But that's why Jesus took on flesh. And that's why he lived the perfect life. And that's why he was crucified in the place of sinners. And he rose from the dead. He conquered death. He conquered sin. He conquered hell. You turn from your sin and trust Jesus if you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus this morning. And you can talk to me afterwards like Travis said or talk with another member. You can do that. Talk with us more about what does this all mean about becoming become a Christian? What is it all about? Talk with us. We'd love to talk with you. Then go to verse 14, back to our text. He says this, as for those who, those who swear by the guilt of Samaria, who say, as, as your God lives, O Dan, and as the way of Beersheba lives, they will fall not right again. Interesting, that word guilt of Samaria, it can also be translated as the God, Ashima. So you could even translate it like this. Those who swear by the Ashima of Samaria. Notice what they're doing. The Ashima of Samaria, the God, your God, O Dan, you live by Beersheba. Notice they're going back to their idolatry and they're focusing upon that. And those who focus on their idolatry, you will fall. That's further reason for God's retribution. They swore by false idolatry. They were deeply religious, but totally hypocritical and religious in the wrong thing. See, they wanted to hear God. They wanted to hear God's word on their own terms. They wanted to listen 
to what God says the way they want to listen to what God says. They responded to their religion and their practices, not to God's religion, not to God's practices. Here's a statement for you. If you want mercy, you must come to God on his terms. If you want grace, you must humble yourself to his word. You cannot come to God on your terms. That's not the way it works. I mean, you don't do God favors. Do we understand that? You don't do God a favor. You don't come to God the way you want to. Is you going to do God a favor by doing this or that? God, I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine. It's not the way it works, man. It doesn't work like that. He will fall, not rise again. So death, that's how he will judge them. All these start with D, by the way. Death, and then destruction. Notice he says, because of this, will not the land quake and everyone who dwells in it mourn? All that will rise up like the Nile and be tossed about and subside like the Nile of Egypt. So notice the two illustrations he gives of destruction. Earthquake and a Nile. Or a flooding, I should say. Now, does he, does he mean literally? Does he mean figuratively? The question an earthquake did take place, remember, in chapter 1? Two years after Amos preached. Which is a foreshadowing of the total destruction that would come by Assyria in 722. But did you know, I didn't know this, <clears throat> did you know that <clears throat> in Israel even today, they have about 200 to 300 earthquakes every day. Most of them, they don't feel them. And I guess they're on this major fault line right there. Israel and that whole area there in Palestine. I, I didn't know that. It's a huge fall line. So he could be talking literally and a real earthquake that's taking place. And then the idea of the Nile, the Nile that is flooding, right? You know, when you have a flood, things will rise up, the, the flood will rise up, they spill over, and then it destroys everything. And then it subsides, and then you have see the remnants of it. So you have the, the picture is an earthquake takes place, bam, everything is just leveled, like a flood coming in, bam, all the water just shoots everything out, destroys everything, and it leaves everything in nothingness. That's the idea. God's judgment would come in like a flood. It would destroy everything, and there's nothing. That's how he was going to judge them. Death, destruction, and notice he says darkness as well. In verse 9, it will come about in that day, declares the Lord God, that I shall make the sun go down at noon and make the earth dark in broad daylight. The darkness of the day of the Lord, the day of Yahweh. In the middle of the day, the sun will grow dark. Again, is it literal? literal? Is it figurative? Uh, maybe it's a miraculous eclipse like, like the Lord did with, with uh, Egypt, remember? In, in those, uh, um, with the ten plates? Maybe that's what happened? Either way, God was going to judge Israel. They could not get away. And he said this before in chapter 5, verse 18. You're longing for the day of the Lord. It's going to be darkness and not light for you. The darkness of Assyria was going to come. And really, that's a foreshadowing of the ultimate day of the Lord. When Christ returns to usher in his kingdom, there will be a darkness that will come. So we must tell people that hell will be darkness. And they must be saved. We must tell them that when we're giving people the gospel of evangelism. So death, destruction, darkness. Notice there's <laughs> despair as well in verse 10. And I shall turn your festivals in the morning. And all your songs of the lamentation. And I will bring sackcloth on everyone's lords and baldness on every head. I will make it like morning for an only son. And the end of it will be like a bitter day. All their happy times will turn to sad times. All their fun songs will turn to wailing. Instead of nice clothes, they put on sackcloth. They have shaved heads, which was a sign of mourning and grieving. Normal activities would cease, a sadness in the air everywhere. And did you see how, how, how really sad it would be? And that's why I put the word despair, because 
It would be like waiting for the only son. Like a couple who had one kid and one son. He's killed. And, and you gotta understand, as, as it is even today, how much more so back then, the sons are represented hope, a provision at your old age. I mean, that, having a son was a big deal at that time. But he's gone. I mean, just the grief. That's what it's going to be like. The despair, total devastation. Even another thing that's similar to Egypt. When the angel of Yahweh came in and killed all the firstborn of Egypt. <clears throat> so from day to night, from festival to funeral, joyful songs to sorrowful, sorrowful song, nice clothes to sackcloth, pretty hair to no hair, joyful birth. It's a sad death. It's terrible. But the last one I think is most important. Dearth. Which is another word. It's a D word. It has to be a D word, right? The word for famine. Famine. And notice it's a famine of his word. His word will not be there. God takes our lack of hearing his word seriously. Don't be fooled. If we will not hear his word, then notice he's going to be silent. He says, days are coming, so the famine, not for bread, not for water, for hearing of the words of the Lord. We fail to recognize how valuable people or, or things are until they're gone, right? Like the Toby Mac song, never know what you got until it's gone. Never know what you got till it's gone. Israel was, in a, was the only nation in the world to receive God's revelatory word. And they went like this. They became so used to hearing, seeing and hearing God's word that they failed to truly listen. It's just like common. Him common. In those days would be a famine. A famine of God's word. His prophetic word. It would not be heard anymore. And look at the extent in verse 12. People will stagger from sea to sea. So from the Dead Sea to the Mediterranean Sea. And from the north even to the east. They would go to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. So it's the whole area from, from the sea to sea, from the north to the east, they're, they're looking for it, but they can't find it. God will be silent because they did not want to hear him earlier. So part of his judgment is his silence. There will be no assurance. They will not be satisfied. They grow faint. See, God's word brings true life. Apart from God's word, the nation could not stand. Apart from God's word, we will not stand. So a famine, a famine of God's word was a mark that God was judging. When there's a famine of God's word, it is his judgment. There will, no, there will be no word from the Lord. He will be silent. Now, they would say, oh, he did listen. They listened only to the false prophets. That's what they listened to. Remember, remember I read you some passages from Jeremiah a few moments ago? Listen to these words from Jeremiah. Jeremiah 14, 13. But ah, Lord God, I said, Jeremiah, Look, the prophets are telling them, you will not see the sword, no one you'd have famine. I will give you lasting peace in this place. Then the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying falsely in my name. I have even sent them, nor commanded them, nor spoken to them. They're prophesying to you a false vision, divination, futility, and deception of their own minds. Therefore, this says the Lord concerning the prophets who are prophesying in my name, although it was not I who sent them. Yet they keep saying, there shall be no sword or famine or in this land. By sword and famine, those prophets shall meet their end. 
And then another place in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, verse 8 and 9. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets who are in your midst and your diviners, diviners deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams which they dream, for they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. They only listen to the false prophet, not the true prophets. See, they wanted to hear what they wanted to hear. So when we think about the fact that when you have prophets, when you have teachers, when you have preachers today who are preaching the word, how do you know it's really the word? They might be false. Well, the reason why there's such low Christian living amongst Christians today is because there's a low view of biblical preaching today. People want their ears tickled. They want to hear what they want to hear. One writer says, the neglected word becomes the absent word. If people are going to ignore God's word, they're going to ignore his word for so long, but now, guess what? They're not going to hear anything at all. And God will just let them hear. You go ahead and hear all the stuff you want to hear. And that's an act of his judgment. No words of comfort. No words of assurance or peace. No words of chaos and death. Now there's going to be silence. Now those false words, now there's going to be silence. They're going to be quiet now. There's going to be nothing. They're going to say, well, well we got to hear from the word of the Lord. we got to hear from him. we got to hear from him. But like anything. Because they needed to repent first, right? Repent first. And then comfort will be found. Yeah, but it's not going to be found in their religious stupidity. It will be found, we're going to see next week. Hope will be found in the Davidic dynasty. Hope will be found in Judah. Oh, you say that to a Yankee. In the South? Forget that. I don't know nothing to do with the South. I'm going to go to Judah. There are losers down there. They don't like that. Not a chance. But that's where hope will be found. It'll be found in Judah. It'll be found in Messiah. And did you notice in the text of verse 13? In that day, the beautiful virgin and the young men will faint from thirst. Even the young people will be affected by this. Even the young people will be seeking after it, but they wouldn't find it. Now, don't you think it's weird? Why does he emphasize young people? Right? I mean, why does he say young people? Well, usually they endure better, right? They're more sustainable, right? But I also think there's a reason why he does this. See, young people, they don't normally look outside of themselves. They don't normally look to themselves, right? Young people look at themselves. Why? Because they're, they're strong, right? We're young. We can do stuff, right? That's young people. They, they just go, whoa, right? They pick up stuff, right? And those old people go, oh, 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 my bad. Can you pick that up at me, son? Right? That's what we do, right? Although, will say, I can blow my sons out still and there's no workouts. <laughs> there will come a day when that won't happen. <laughs> can you help me across the room, please? Right. But that's what I think. I mean, young people normally look to themselves, to their, their looks, right, to their strength, to their stability. So what is it saying? Even they would seek God's word. Even they would come to a place it's not about our looks. It's not about our stability. It's not about our strength. It's about God's word. But God will be silent. Because it's too late. A couple thoughts for you. Today, we have the full written word. And the written word points us to the living word. If you're not a follower of Jesus today, come to the living word and you will find salvation in him. Come to Jesus to be saved. Because in this word is the living word. Another thought for you to provoke your thinking. Have we forgotten or flippantly taken God's word? Not understanding its great weight. Are we consistently reading, studying, and hearing God's word? What does God want you to hear this morning from his word? 
about how you can live, how you should live. What does he want you to hear? Remember, it's not the fact that you're here. It's about that you hear what he says. What have you been neglecting in God's word? What have you said? You know, I don't want to listen to that. I don't want to listen to you. I don't want to listen to this or listen to that. No. And this is the reason why. The reason why we take 40 to 50 minutes on a Sunday morning to do expository preaching. This is why we take time in the word of service. And why we don't devote time to other things and other worthwhile things. There's, there's a lot of things we can do in our time together. There, there is a lot of things we can do. But this is why we do this, because we take this scripture seriously. We do. Your leaders do. And yet, though the word may be given precedence, is the press. It's sad when people who spend years in a church that's giving the word have not changed. Because it's not in the heart. See, this is why it's not so much, I keep saying this, it's not so much you're here, but that you're here. You're here. The Spirit has, has to do a work in your heart. You must take the Spirit to do a work in your heart to change you. Learning and applying God's word, says one writer, is not a spectator sport. It applies learning, it applies to you doing, not just watching. So are you only here today? Or have you come to hear? Are you just here today? Or did you come to hear? Hear God's word. Much for us to ponder. We'll take a few moments of silence.